Okay. Um, uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, this is my first uh, conference that involves philosophy of physics, so I'm very uh, interested to hear the different perspectives on uh, on cosmology and and the kinds of things that I study from a um, from a pure physics uh, perspective. Um, so I'm going to talk about dark matter and kind of what we know about dark matter, how we know about dark matter, um, what kinds of clues we have to the nature of dark matter and how we're trying to figure that out. I'll say a little bit about my own work, but it'll be more broad, um, more broadly covering kind of where we're at in this in this field right now. Um, you know, one of the reasons that dark matter is an important problem, I mean, it's important in astrophysics and cosmology because dark matter is you know, most of the matter in the universe and, and therefore we'd like to know what it is. But from a sort of fundamental physics perspective, it's, it's also important because if you'll notice, the entire standard model of particle physics is in this little sort of 5% slice of the universe. Um, and if we can understand something about either of these <coughs> two other pieces of what the universe is made of, then we can, we'll have a better, uh, a better sort of starting point to understanding fundamental physics as a whole. So if we, if we can, um, if we can understand dark matter, then we can potentially revise the standard model of particle physics and have kind of a jumping off point to whatever the next theory is. Um, so there's a lot of, there's a lot that we uh, don't know about dark matter, and I'll go through a few of the things that we don't know. So we don't know its origin or, or like what kind of particle it is, if it is indeed a particle, which mostly we assume it is, but there are other possibilities. Um, what that, the mass of that particle might be. Uh, if you, depending on what kinds of models you're considering, you can have a range of something like 80 orders of magnitude in mass for what dark matter might be, from incredibly light particles to black holes that are incredibly massive. And so uh, we, we have sort of very little uh, to, to go on in terms of the mass of the individual dark matter um, particles or, or pieces. Uh, we don't know the thermal history of dark matter, so you know whether it was ever in equilibrium with the standard model particles at the beginning of the universe or not. Um, we don't know if it has some non-trivial evolution in the sense of was it just created at some point in the beginning and then it's been kind of you know diffusing through the universe as as you know pressureless matter since then, or has there been some kind of evolution where dark matter may have been created or destroyed uh, since the the very early universe? Um, one component or many, you know, it's uh, depending on who you ask, it might be more extravagant to hypothesize a single particle we can't detect or a whole zoo of particles we can't detect. And that's something that um, uh, we, we don't have a perspective on at the moment. Most of the constraints on dark matter assume that it's all the same kind of stuff, but uh, you can imagine a whole dark sector with different uh, components. Uh, we don't know if it has any non-gravitational interactions, either with itself or with standard model particles. So um, we don't know if it has, you know, if there's like a fifth force, uh, if it has any kind of particle physics um, interactions, you know, that don't involve gravity. Um, and we don't know the small scale behavior in the sense that, you know, we know there are dark matter halos, so, you know, big sort of clumps of dark matter that are on the scale of galaxies. We don't know how far down that goes. So depending on the different models, you might have uh, dark matter halos that go down to Earth mass or smaller. Um, uh, some some uh, models, their dark matter only can collect at galaxy scales and it's utterly smooth be below that. Um, so that's something we also don't know. But there's a lot that we do know about dark matter, which is part of what makes it fun to, to study is that we do have somewhere to go with it. We have some information. So um, we, we have uh, quite a lot of understanding of where it is. We can map out dark matter with gravitational lensing. Um, and we can we can really see where it's concentrated in the universe via its effects on other matter. Um, we know how much is out there. Um, we can make maps. This is an older version of a map of um, all of the matter in the universe based on the distortions in the cosmic microwave background. Um, we have uh, really good ways to determine the total quantity of, of dark matter in the universe. Uh, we know quite a lot about what it's doing in the sense of how it's uh, how dark matter um, has evolved over time, how it interacts with uh, the growth of, of regular uh, baryonic matter structure, and uh, you know to, to some degree we know what it isn't because we've been looking for it for a while and we haven't uh, figured it out yet. Um, 
so, so we know all that stuff about dark matter, um, but uh, you know, one of the questions that, that comes up a lot with dark matter is, you know, can we can we explain uh, the phenomena of dark matter with some other um, some other explanation? You know, can you can you write away, write off dark matter by saying, well, you're just messing with gravity? All we see are gravitational effects. Can it be something else? Um, how do we know anything about dark matter? Uh, you know, where, what do we learn from uh, the observations? And uh, so a lot of times when you hear talks about dark matter, they'll talk about sort of one or two pieces of evidence for dark matter. And, um, and then, you know, there can be a discussion. But uh, at some point I was uh, giving a presentation about dark matter at a, a conference and I thought, well, how many, how many pieces of evidence do we have that are, that are actually independent and, and what does the sort of total of that evidence look like? Um, and so I came up with 13 pieces of basically independent evidence for, for dark matter from different regimes, from different scales. Um, and they're all, I, I should note that, you know, I'll tell you about these different uh, pieces of evidence and what they tell us, um, but I, I should note that they're all entirely consistent with the same quantity and, um, and basic behavior of dark matter in the universe. So, okay, so the one that's, that's kind of most famous, I guess, is uh, galaxy rotation curves, where, you know, the, the speed of, um, of rotation around galaxies uh, should sort of drop off in a Keplerian way if you don't have dark matter and instead uh, the, the speed of, of stars and gas going around galaxies flattens out at, high, at large radii. Um, and this was, this was the, the kind of piece of evidence that, I guess, uh, more or less kind of convinced the community, various studies around, around this, that there has to be some extra <coughs> in galaxies uh, holding all the stars in. Um, and that tells us something about the mass fraction of dark matter and the distribution of dark matter. This is from kind of the 1970s, but there was there's evidence before that from dynamics of clusters. So, from uh, Fritz Zwicky in the 1930s and, and some others looking at uh, how galaxies are moving around in clusters. For example, the Coma Cluster, um, just seeing that, that the movement of the galaxies uh, in the clusters implied the existence of more mass than than could be accounted for by just counting up the galaxies. So that tells us, again, something about the mass fraction and the distribution of matter. Um, but uh, we can also learn something from the gas in the clusters. So when we look at an image of a galaxy cluster like this, we see all the, the galaxies um, in the visible light. But if we look at it with, um, with uh, X-ray light, we see that there's a big glow in the cluster. And that's the, the intercluster medium, the cluster gas. And that turns out to be something like 90% of the luminous matter. So if you if you weigh up all the cluster gas and then all the stuff that's actually just in the galaxies, the gas is, it, it vastly outweighs uh, the galaxies themselves. Um, and that gives us also a clue about the existence of dark matter because that cluster gas is very hot and it should be kind of diffusing through the universe if there's not enough gravity to hold it in. And we know that the galaxies aren't providing enough gravity because they're just not very much uh, compared to the mass of the, of the cluster gas. And so, you, you need extra matter to create the gravitational well that can hold all that, um, all that luminous gas uh, in the cluster. Um, we also have uh, strong gravitational lensing, so it's not super easy to see in this image, but um, there, there are a couple of little arcs uh, in, this, in this picture that are, um, are the distorted images of the background galaxies, distorted by the gravitational lensing of the clusters. And with strong gravitational lensing, you can kind of you can get an idea of how much total matter there is because the the distortion of space time by the um, by the mass doesn't care if it's visible mass or, or invisible mass and so um, you can map out where the um, where the matter must be based on gravitational lensing um, and and you can get a, an idea of the distribution and you can also see that you need way more matter to do that much lensing than is available with just the galaxies themselves. So that's another piece. And that tells us something about, again, the mass fraction and distribution. But we can do uh, even more sort of detailed gravitational lensing measurements. So, so with strong gravitational lensing, we're really looking at big distortions where you have these, these giant arcs or multiple images. But there's also weak gravitational lensing where what you're really looking at is 
stuff that's, that's way off in the corners of the images or, or way in the background. And you kind of just look at the orientations of all the galaxies in the background, and you average it up, and you see if they're mostly oriented you know, in a sort of a tangential way or, or in a radial way. And where they're more oriented in a tangential way, that gives you a clue that there's more matter you know, in that direction. Um, it's a statistical measurement that allows us to, to get really fine images of where the dark matter is. And here's an example of that, where there are two galaxy clusters. And using weak gravitational lensing, you can map out the existence of matter um, where these clusters are, and also in between, where there's not really a lot of uh, visible matter. There's, you don't have a huge overdensity of, of galaxies in the middle, but there's this filament of matter stretching between the clusters, and that's the kind of um, that's the kind of sort of fine mapping of dark matter that's possible with um, with weak gravitational lensing. So it really tells you the shape and the structure of dark matter um, in these environments. There's one more kind of gravitational lensing um, that is uh, called cosmological microlensing. So, so uh, cosmological microlensing is where you have um, you have a, a system set up where there's a galaxy, and so we're at the Earth here. There's a galaxy creating a gravitational lens, and then there's a quasar in the background, and that qu there's one quasar, but because of the lensing, you get four images of that quasar. And so you get what's called an Einstein cross uh, picture, where you see the galaxy in the middle, and then you see these four images of the quasar in the background. You need a special alignment to get, to get that system, but there are quite a lot of examples of this it's a big universe. And, um, and one of the things that that allows you to do is it allows you to actually probe what the matter in that lens galaxy is made of, because as the alignment shifts, a little bit between the Earth and the galaxy and the, the quasar, or even just as the components of the galaxy move around, um, you get little microlensing events. You get little blips in the um, in these four images, and so you can have a situation where the ratio of the brightnesses of the images changes over time. So that ratio of the brightnesses is, in, in to first order, just determined by the strong lensing by how much um, distortion is in the kind of big lens system. But because you can have these uh, little blips where you know a star gets really close to the light path and magnifies one of the images, you can get these, um, these very flux ratios in, the, in those images. And what that can do is, is really constrain the fraction of matter that's in compact objects, like stars or black holes, that can make these little, these little blips and the fraction of matter that's totally smoothly distributed. And so there's, there have been um, studies that have, that have really uh, given a, a great deal of evidence to the idea that the dark matter is smoothly distributed through the galaxy. And it's not just that there's a whole lot of little planets or stars that we didn't see that are, that are creating that extra matter. There's really something smoothly distributed through the galaxy. And most of the matter is smoothly distributed. And it's not in compact objects like stars and black holes. So that's a, a kind of newer and more subtle piece of evidence. But it also tells us something about like the nature of the dark matter, because it tells us that it's not something that's at least on this or on certain scales in, in very compact objects. Um, then there's the cosmic microwave background. So by looking at the cosmic microwave background and by decomposing it into uh, the power spectrum as a function of angular scale, um, so just looking at where there's more power on, on different scales uh, in, the, in the sky. Um, that the, the pattern there, these acoustic peaks, are, are really determined by how, how the, the primordial plasma is kind of um, bouncing in and out of the gravitational wells that are laid down at the, at the end of inflation that are um, sort of the, the primordial density peaks. And because of that, uh, the, the ratio of, of sort of regular matter, this plasma, and the collisionless matter of the, of the dark matter um, gives you different kinds of, of sort of rebounds in this, uh, in this acoustic oscillation. So it's a bit of a subtle thing, but, but really the, the ratios of the different peaks um, tell you something about how much of the matter is regular matter and how much is collisionless. And I, I keep talking about collisionless matter because the thing that really 
uh, characterizes dark matter is that it's, vis it's invisible in the sense that it doesn't interact with the electromagnetic field, as far as we know. And so if it's something doesn't interact with electromagnetism, it's also untouchable, right? So um, it's collisionless, and that's, um, that's kind of the, the main sort of feature. Um, so you can, you can look at those, that, that ratio, and, and here's, a, um, uh, here's just an, a, a different way of viewing the data, showing that the, um, the, the data points go out to extremely high multipoles and fit this model extremely well. And this model is the concordance model of cosmology, which includes you know, dark matter, dark energy, hot big bang inflation, homogeneity and isotropy. Um, all of these, these ingredients really only, uh, like, you really only get that, um, that agreement with, with all those ingredients, including the, the right fraction of the, of the matter being collisionless. Um, so, so that's the cosmic ray background, and then you get kind of similar information from the matter power spectrum. So just looking at how much power is in uh, matter at different scales, at scales larger than the cosmic ray background. Um, uh, and and depending, if you kind of plot it differently, you can look at for different uh, masses of dark matter, um, assuming that it's kind of thermalized dark matter, uh, you get um, you get cutoffs at different scales in the matter power spectrum, basically saying that um, if you if the matter if the dark matter is too hot, it washes out small scale structure. Um, and so you can't have little galaxies if the if the dark matter is too hot being this is in this case equivalent to saying the particles are too light. Um, and so that gives you limits on um, the mass of the dark matter particle being greater than a few keV. But that's sort of model dependent. It depends on, on what kind of model you're talking about. There are axion models that don't meet that um, criterion. Um, but again, it's just telling you something about how much collisionless matter can be out there. Um, what, another one that I think is kind of um, uh, underappreciated is just the fact that the large scale structure of the universe is, is there and what the, the statistics of it are. So uh, this is a this is a, a snapshot from a cosmological simulation of, it's an n-body simulation, a dark matter only simulation with the initial conditions coming from the cosmomicrowave background distribution. And if you let the simulation run, you get uh, the cosmic web building up as matter um, uh, comes together in, in filaments and clusters, and you get these uh, giant voids showing up. And that cosmic web structure um, comes very naturally from most of the matter in the universe being collisionless matter. This, this simulation has no collisional matter in it at all. It's just dark matter only. And if you do that simulation, and then you, pull, you know, sort of sprinkle the galaxies on where the, where the matter is most dense, um, then you get an extremely good agreement between the um, between your simulation and uh, the large scale structure actually seen in the universe, and that's something that's is really difficult to do with only collisional matter. If you if you only had collisional matter, this whole thing would be kind of smeared out and gray. Like you just wouldn't get that uh, that structure. And so you know if you actually do a comparison between numerical uh, simulations of the large scale structure and the distribution of, of galaxies on these large scales, um, uh, statistically they're identical. It, it, just, it just really works very well. Um, so in this uh, visualization, two of the slices are observation and two of them are a numerical simulation that starts with dark matter only. Um, if, if you're familiar with astronomical observations, you can probably tell which is which, but if you're not, um, you probably can't. Uh, so uh, it turns out that uh, the uh, blue ones are the observation, the red ones are the simulation, um, but they're, uh, they're really indistinguishable. Um, there's, there's one piece that's, that's been, it kind of got a lot of news when it was uh, first discussed, the, the, it's called the bullet cluster, um, it's sometimes called the smoking gun for, for dark matter's existence. So this is a system where you had two clusters of galaxies. So there's a little cluster over here and a big cluster over here. Um, and sometime in the cosmically recent past, the, they, they were on opposite sides and the little cluster like shot through the big cluster, they collided. And you can tell that the little cluster shot through the big cluster because this X-ray glowing gas, which here is depicted in the pink, 
um, created this, this nice shock wave, like a bullet, uh, on this side. And so you see that the, the cluster gas kind of got stuck in sort of in the middle between the two clusters when the collision happened. Um, and so, and it hasn't sort of washed out yet. Like it, it's recent enough that, that it's still sort of stuck in the middle as, as those two clusters collided, the gas got stuck and, and uh, created the shock wave and then kind of lingered there. And in the blue here, the blue is the, uh, the, um, the mass distribution based on weak gravitational lensing. So what, what you can see from that is that most of the mass is gathered where the galaxies and the cluster are gathered, but most of the light is, uh, is from this, um, the, the X-ray gas. And, and since we already established that most of the luminous matter in a cluster of galaxies is, is the X-ray glowing gas, if uh, if, dark matter, if dark matter were not real, but were just like regular matter being stronger somehow, then the, the gravity really should be where the gas is. And since the gravity, the bulk of the gravity is separated from the gas, um, uh, the, the inference is that what happened is the cluster is collided, the gas got stuck in the middle, the galaxies flew right through because there's enough space in between that they don't collide, and then the dark matter, which is collidionless, also went through. And, st and, and stayed where the galaxies are. And um, so that, that's kind of a, a, a rare system where we've separated out the, uh, the luminous from the dark matter and really seen that they have to be uh, different uh, components. It also tells us something about um, you know, whether the dark matter has self-interactions, if it's sticky. So there are lots of systems like this where you look for whether the dark matter can get stuck in the middle as well. And so far, you know, there are good limits on how sticky the dark matter can be from, from systems like this. Um, so so that's, that's one piece that I think is probably pretty compelling, just because to explain, explain this without dark matter, you would need the, the matter to be putting gravity somewhere else. Right? And that's, that's a tricky thing to do. Um, there's also evidence from Big Bang nucleosynthesis from the sort of abundance of elements that were created during uh, the, the hot big bang. Um, and the, I won't go into the plot exactly, but the, what, it's, what it's showing us is that there's just not very much baryonic matter in the universe. Um, and uh, the, so it gives us some information about the total amount of baryonic matter. It's not enough to be all of the matter in the universe. So dark matter has to be something else. There's still some question about what's going on with lithium, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't change the conclusion that there's very little regular matter in the universe. Um, we also get something from local stellar motions. So I told you about the, the information from how the, the stars are kind of moving around the center of the galaxy, the rotation around the center of the galaxy. There's also motion up and down in the plane uh, of the galaxy. And that also responds to the total amount of matter in the galaxy. And so this is like, this is like a, a vertical slice through the, the, um, the galaxy where you have uh, the disk here. The disk is like mostly here. And then there's stuff in the halo and, and the thick disk. And it's looking at, at how stars are moving up and down in, um, in that sort of region. Um, and you can plot out like the, the circular velocity around the center and the, the scatter up and down in the, um, away from the plane. And if you compare the, um, the measurements to a, a model where you have the amount of dark matter that we expect in the galaxy versus MOND, which is a, um, an alternative where you just use gravity to change the amount of gravity, or, you, know, you change gravity, uh, if it's the, the dark matter um, version better. So uh, then there's, there's one more that I want to talk about that's a little bit, um, a little bit more subtle but uh, and, and only of, of limited use, but I think kind of cool anyway. Um, so there are certain models of modified gravity designed to uh, to rule, to explain away dark matter, where uh, the gravity and the light follow different geodesics through the universe. Um, and uh, and if that's if that were the case, then if you have a situation like uh, this gravitational wave event GW seventeen oh eight one seven, where two neutron stars collided, created a big burst of 
light in a whole bunch of different wavelengths, and also gravitational waves, um, the light and the gravity shouldn't arrive at the same time, basically because both of them, if they're, if, they're, well, if they're following the same geodesics, if they're following the same paths through space-time at the same speed, then when they encounter a, um, a gravitational well, they'll kind of dip in and out of it, and there'll be a delay. Uh, it's called the Shapiro delay. And given how far away this event occurred, that delay would add up to something like 400 days. Um, it took, uh, it took uh, like something like um, I don't know several hundred million years or something for the for the light to to get to us. So that's not a significant delay in terms of the total travel time, but it is a significant enough delay that if if they weren't both following the same geodesics, then there should be a, a difference between the, the light and the gravity arrival that's, that was more than what was measured, and what was measured was 1.7 seconds. Right? So, so we don't know exactly why there was a 1.7 second difference, something to do with the mechanism that produced the light versus um, exactly when the gravitational wave event was, was created, but, but you know, if you're within two seconds, uh, you really have to have been following the same path and uh, going at the same speed. So that's just something that sort of rules out certain non-GR, you know, non-general relativity <laughs> versions of gravity that are, were designed to, to solve um, the dark matter problem. Um, and if you're interested in more uh, sort of different ways that gravitational waves can probe dark matter models, there's a, a paper that, um, that I was involved with looking at a bunch of different probes of, of dark matter with gravitational waves. So anyway, uh, that whole exercise was just to show that, that although we haven't detected the dark matter particle and we don't know what it is, uh, the abundance of evidence is really, really strong that there is a phenomenon uh, that acts exactly like a new kind of particle that just doesn't do electromagnetism, does have some mass, and the uh, all of the clues around the distribution and abundance of that particle are, um, are consistent on a massive range of scales, different kinds of phenomena, uh, different epochs in the universe, all of them point to very much the same thing. So then we can ask kind of what is it and how are we trying to figure it out? So the usual assumption that we start with is a weakly interacting massive particle. So weakly being, sometimes people use weakly to mean interacting via the weak force, sometimes they just mean not very much but uh, interacts via uh, either, either only weakly or not at all in terms of particle physics sense, has mass, acts like a particle, uh, so we call it a wimp. And the, um, the kind of standard starting point for that is what's called a, a standard thermal wimp. Um, so it, it comes down to this idea of the, the wimp miracle, which is an old picture, there's less uh, sort of support for it now than there used to be, but the idea is that uh, there's everything's kind of in thermal equilibrium in the beginning, and then when that thermal equilibrium is, is no longer there, then the dark matter kind of freezes out, and uh, depending on the like scattering, uh, the annihilation cross section um, with uh, it, into you know, regular matter and back. Um, you get different abundances of dark matter, and so if you take a weak scale mass and cross section, you get the right abundance of dark matter today. Um, and so the nice thing about that is that if you do have a particle like this that is that was in, in equilibrium with regular matter in the beginning, in this annihilation equilibrium, then uh, it gives you a bunch of opportunities for discovery. So this particular model of dark matter has uh, annihilation scattering production. We can look for it in different ways. So. The idea here is that um, you know you have dark matter is the the blue regular matter is the yellow um, some kind of interaction happens right and so if if you read the the diagram that way you're looking at annihilation so you're looking at the idea that dark matter can annihilate with itself and create regular matter and then you can look for it with um, stuff you know sort of showing up in the sky it's called indirect detection um, it also means you can look at it the other way and say, well, if we can make regular matter with dark matter, we should be able to do the opposite. So you smash protons together and you try to find dark matter coming out uh, with collider searches. Or uh, if you read it kind of up or down, um, you get uh, the idea that dark matter can recoil off of regular matter. And, um, and then you look for that, um, that recoil in, a, uh, in a, an experiment. Um, 
And so I'll say a little bit about the direct detection experiments first. So this is a plot, a very busy plot that I'll walk through from 2013. Um, and I'll talk about how things have changed since then. But this was like, this was the moment when things were, I feel like, the most hopeful for, for dark matter direct detection. So this is a plot of the uh, sort of interaction strength versus the mass of uh, dark matter particles. And these are experiments where, generally speaking, you take your detector, you put it deep underground, uh, you wait for something to run into the, your, your detector target, and you look at the recoil. And, and based on the kind of recoil you get when you know, one of your nuclei moves when you didn't expect it to, um, that, that could be, you, you say that that's consistent with a certain interaction cross-section um, and a certain mass of the particle based on the amount of energy that's, uh, that's deposited. And so the colored, uh, colored contours here are all detections in experiments where they saw some kind of recoil and they said that's consistent with a particle of this mass and this cross-section, right? So um, you have a number of different experiments, cogent, test, gamma, libra, CDMS, and they all kind of they all kind of gather in this part of the plot. And so you could kind of stand back and squint and say, you know, maybe something's happening up here. You know, the, all the detections are sort of pointing to a similar mass and cross-section. But the problem is that you then have to look at these curved lines. And these curved lines are all exclusion limits from other experiments, and they all exclude everything in that direction, right? So every one of these detections is ruled out by at least one other experiment, um, and in most cases, several. And then, the, unfortunately, it's just gotten worse, right? So, so this is a more recent plot um, from uh, 2022, where we've, we've only left one of those detection contours on there, as everything else, there have been revised experiments and they've gone away. But you see that, that little bean shape up there labeled DAMA, all the other lines are exclusion limits, excluding the stuff in the green region, right? So, so the, the, the detections are all like very strongly ruled out at this point. I'll talk a little bit more about DAMA in a moment um, because it's a kind of special case in certain ways. Um, and so we're kind of just pushing farther and farther down in interaction strength and in mass. Um, and that's sort of the name of the game at the moment, but it's going to get complicated really soon because we're going to run into what's called the neutrino wall or the neutrino floor or the neutrino fog, depending on who you ask. And this is, this is where if you get to this region of the plot, then the recoil in your experiment is, um, your, your experiment is basically so sensitive that it's going to pick up uh, neutrinos. So neutrinos are going to scatter off the stuff in your experiment and, and bump it around enough that you won't be able to tell the difference between neutrinos and dark matter. And you can't shield from neutrinos. Neutrinos will go through everything. Um, and these are solar neutrinos. And so you know, different, uh, uh, different processes that create solar neutrinos here, um, geothermal stuff, uh, atmospheric neutrinos over here. So below this, this curve, you, you, you have no hope of telling the difference between a recoil in your experiment coming from neutrinos or coming from a dark matter event. And so, you know, we're almost there with, with some of these experiments. And if, if it turns out that the dark matter interaction strength and mass really do live in this region, then we have a problem. Um, there are two ways around that uh, that, in, that involve um, uh, extra information from detections that, that, can, that can disambiguate between stuff coming, uh, neutrinos coming from the sun and dark matter just in the sort of, so, you know, in the environment, right? Uh, in the galactic environment. And one of them is, uh, is annual modulation. So I have a diagram for what's going on there, but I feel like when I explain uh, annual modulation, I, it's most effective if done via interpretive dance. So, so hold me, hold, 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 say, hold, uh, yeah, give me a second here. Okay, so. Let's imagine that this is the center of the galaxy, okay? Now, um, my head is the sun, okay? The sun is, is orbiting the center of the galaxy. The galaxy is full of a dark matter halo, right? So it's full of dark matter. So I'm moving through a sphere of dark matter as I, as I move around. And so as I'm moving around, I have like a wind of dark matter on my face, right? So there's a certain direction from which most of the dark matter should be coming as I'm orbiting around the center of the galaxy. Okay, now this is the Earth. All right, so the Earth is going around the sun, and at certain times of year, 
the earth is going more into the dark matter wind, another time is going more out of the wind. And so you should have a higher dark matter flux around June and a lower dark matter flux around December. And so if you can, if you have an experiment that just measures the flux of stuff hitting your detector and you have more in June and less in December, even if you don't know for sure what that stuff is, then that might be a sign that what you're seeing is, is the dark matter. Okay, hold on, let me put this away. All right, so the Dama Libre experiment sees exactly that, right? They don't, they don't have good shielding, they don't have good event, um, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, distinctions, but they do see a sinusoidal signal of more something happening around June and less something happening around December. And this has been going on for years. So this is uh, some more recent data um, where they really see this, this, uh, this signal going on for a long time. The last time I picked up this, uh, this data, they had 11.9 sigma detection of something varying um, uh, annually. But again, they don't know, they don't have a way of distinguishing whether they're seeing dark matter or something else. Um, and they are ruled out by all the other experiments. Now, you can try and get around that because the, the target material that they use is different from most of the other experiments. So you could imagine that maybe dark matter interacts differently with their target or something else. But the problem is, like, there are a lot of things that could just change with the seasons, right? So when it's, when it's June, not only are we moving more toward the dark matter wind, it's also you know, spring, summer, right? When it's December, we're moving more away from the wind, but it's also winter. And, and there are things that could change, like the thickness of the atmosphere could change the number of muons or stuff like that, like it could mess, mess with the rock in the experiment. And nobody's figured out like what is to blame for this yet. There have been a whole lot of attempts. Nobody's solved the, that problem, but it still is a little worrying. That, that it's just an annual thing. We don't know for sure if it's from space or from seasons. And so one way around that is to take advantage of the fact that, you know, if your experiment is up there in summer, then down there it's winter, but you should have the same movement into the dark matter wind, right? And so there's an experiment that I've been involved with in Australia, where what they're doing is they have one detector up here in Italy and one in, uh, in Australia, and they're, they have the same target material. And the idea is to see if there's an modul uh, annual modulation and if it's in phase or out of phase. So is it astrophysical or is it the seasons? Um, and they're still, they're still setting that up. They haven't started taking science data on that yet, but it should be, they said within a couple of years of data taking, they should be able to confirm or rule out um, the, uh, the Dama Libra experiment uh, result. So that's one way where like, the solar neutrino flux should not vary in that way. And so if you do see a signal that's an annual modulation, it's, it's, it's evocative, but maybe it's dark matter. Another thing you can do to distinguish between dark matter and uh, neutrinos is just to use, if, if you knew which direction the events were coming from, that would help a lot. Um, so. Um, basically, so this is, here's our galaxy, there's the sun, okay, this is not to scale. Um, so the sun has, you know, the earth going around it, and there's the, uh, the dark matter halo, and as we're moving through the halo, um, the neutrinos are all coming from the sun, and the uh, dark matter is mostly coming from, from the wind, and, and these are never going to be in the same direction. Um, the, uh, the dark matter wind is coming from the direction of the constellation Cygnus. Uh, the sun does not go through Cygnus in, in its path through the sky. So if you look at you know, the path of the ecliptic, you know, the sun is, is following this path. So at a certain time of year, you know, the, the neutrinos should all be coming from over there and the dark matter should be coming from over there. And they, they can get kind of close, but they're never gonna fully overlap. Right, so if you can tell which direction your um, dark matter is coming from, then you can tell you can either go down below that neutrino floor in principle and, and still see the dark matter. So there's a um, a project that I'm uh, affiliated with um, called Cygnus. It's like a network of of uh, directional detection projects. The idea is to to um, to you know basically 
bunch of these detectors in different parts of the world, and um, you can potentially get uh, limits down into that um, into that neutrino floor. So again, there's um, information about that online. Okay, so with direct detection, it's a little ambiguous. Probably we haven't seen anything yet. I think there's almost nobody who believes the, the DAMA result who is not part of the DAMA uh, collaboration. Um, a lot of the people in the DAMA collaboration absolutely think they found dark matter, but uh, but large, the larger community is, is pretty skeptical. And there's a, a few sort of sociological reasons for that as well, um, in addition to just the data sort of favoring the other explanation. Um, but we're also looking for dark matter in other ways. So I mentioned dark matter annihilation being something we can look for. And that's that's kind of interesting right now because there, if, if you expect that dark matter is annihilating, you should see a lot of um, a lot of annihilation power, whatever is produced by the dark matter annihilation coming from the center of the galaxy, because that's where most of the dark matter is in our galaxy. And we do actually see something in the center of our galaxy that we don't have a good explanation for right now. So um, this is just a, sort of the total flux of gamma rays in the center of the galaxy. And then if you sur subtract out everything we can think of that could be producing gamma rays, um, there's a little dot that's left over. It's a little bit of gamma ray uh, flux coming from the center of the galaxy. And it's been there for, I mean, we've known about it for many years. Um, and it's consistent with certain models of dark matter annihilation. And, uh, and the problem is, though, that like if you're trying to look at something in the center of the galaxy, there's a lot of stuff between here and there, so it's quite hard to sort of isolate what's going on in the center of the galaxy. But also, we can't, we just can't see the center of the galaxy very well, so we don't know for sure what else could be there causing trouble. Um, and specifically, pulsars are, are really good at creating gamma ray, um, you know, gamma ray flux. And if there are a bunch of pulsars hanging out in the center of the galaxy, they could be producing all these gamma rays. Um, and, and fooling us. Um, now, whether or not there is a cluster of pulsars at the center of the galaxy is kind of unclear. Whether or not there should be is kind of unclear. And we know there are other weird populations of stars at the center of the galaxy. Um, but, uh, but we just don't know for sure about that signal. And it's going to take a while to really uh, understand that. There have been incredible debates back and forth in the literature about whether or not that looks like smoothly distributed dark matter or point sources like gamma rays, and we just don't have a clear enough signal yet to, to know. Um, so we don't know for sure. There are other pieces of, th there are other signals that have been suggested to be uh, dark matter annihilation. So um, there are extra positrons at high energy just in our solar environment that have been seen by a number of different satellites. Um, and most recently, uh, a detector called AMS, which is sort of a little box hanging off the end of, the, of this International Space Station that collects uh, uh, cosmic rays. And it sees way more positrons than we expect to. You kind of expect that there should be fewer positrons at higher energies, so it should come down like this. And AMS and a bunch of other experiments see this upturn. And one explanation for that is that there's dark matter annihilating in our vicinity, and it's creating a bunch of these positrons. Um, but uh, unfortunately, pulsars also make positrons. so. Uh, it, it's been shown that you can explain this signal with just like a few pulsars in our galactic neighborhood that we didn't know about. Um, so that's that's annoying, um, and and we we just don't know for sure what's going on with that. But there's also the AMS experiment has also been seeing antiprotons at high energy. So this yellow is kind of the expectation, the red is the signal they see. So they just see more antiprotons at high energy than expected. And you can't do that with pulsars, so that's great. Um, but uh, you can do that with supernova remnants. And um, there have been suggestions that, that, well, there have been a couple of things. One is that exactly how certain this, this background expectation is is unclear. And then also, uh, it turns out that with certain distribution of supernova remnants, you might be able to make uh, antiprotons. So um, those are just a few of the sort of potential hints. There are a couple of other ones, but mostly they're debated enough that it's, uh, you know, it, it, they're not super compelling. I think this one is the one that's like most interesting from a sort of current data perspective. So anyway, the situation basically with dark matter right now is, you know, in terms of direct detection, it's inconclusive. Um, there's one experiment that thinks they saw something everybody else doesn't. 
that with indirect detection, it's also inconclusive. There may be a signal. It might be pulsars or something else. With um, production, I didn't even have a slide on that because we just we just haven't seen that. We haven't seen evidence that, that we're producing dark matter at the LHC. But the astrophysical evidence is, is really, really very strong right? and very consistent with uh, uh, the same kind of model. Um, so I just want to check what's, uh, I don't know exactly what the timing is in terms of when we got started again. We've had about 45 minutes. Okay, so I'll just wrap up then. Okay, so yeah, so basically the way we're at, where the place we're at right now is with dark matter, um, we, we don't know what it is, and we've had a few sort of simple models that we haven't been able to verify with experiment or observation. And so we're really kind of, the field is sort of branching out into looking at lots and lots of different kinds of dark matter that would have different phenomenology. Um, and we're thinking about what the different um, expectations of all those different models would be. Um, and usually it revolves around different behavior at small scales, but, um, but there, there are lots of interesting places to look. There's a huge community of people looking at dark matter um, and I'm looking for new ways to, to learn about it. So uh, I'll just kind of end there, I guess, and, uh, and take questions. Thanks. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Katie. I wanted to just very briefly um, set out what I think is a, a philosophical parallel to the kind of case you're making for dark matter, the, summer, the case you're summarizing for dark matter. So um, this goes back, so this is a, a kind of case that philosophers have long considered as a response to underdetermination. So philosophers tend to be skeptical a lot, so under, uh, worrying about underdetermination is kind of an occupational hazard for philosophers. But there's a style of argument that uh, maybe is best exemplified by Jean Perrin, a physicist working at the beginning of the 20th century, who made a compelling case for the atomic constituents of matter based on a very similar style of argument, where he considered a variety of different types of evidence that were independent, that all could be used to constrain Avogadro's number. And that ranged from the experimental work he had done on Brownian motion, to things like the color of the sky, which gives you an indirect constraint on Avogadro's number based on uh, Rayleigh scattering. And so he had, uh, I think it was actually also 13 uh, ways to measure Avogadro's number that he made a case for in this book, Adams. And he said all of these gave you roughly consistent determinations of Avogadro's number. His case was simpler because it was a single number that he was trying to constrain. Uh, but the, the argument was that because these independent measurements, each of which were uh, based on different aspects of theory, gave you an agreeing number. This gave you a really compelling case for atomism. Now, I mention this because I think it brings out a few things that lead us to interesting questions for the kind of case that we can make for dark matter now that you've so beautifully summarized. Um, so in the case of Perrin's argument, I think it was essential that there was stability, namely that the individual measurements gave you reliable, repeatable results. There's convergence among the different measurements. And so I gave, you know, you got similar answers within, uh, st uh, within some standard deviations. There's a little irony here because the experimental work that Perrin did was actually uh, several percent off of the consensus value. So within about a decade, people tried to understand what was going on with his measurements, that there's some source of systematic error that he hadn't really appreciated. And finally, there was a, um, an amenability to increase precision of the measurements. So you could continue to pursue these experimental techniques and get higher and higher precision measurements. And you could then put more pressure on whether you had stability and convergence. The other element that's interesting is, I, I don't know if I mentioned the date, this was 1913. So this was before the quantum theory had developed. So he was able to make the case for the atomic constituents of matter, despite a huge amount of ignorance about what these atomic constituents really were. And so I think that also brings out a nice parallel with the case of dark matter. So I think this sets up a few questions. One is just uh, which of these approaches do you think uh, have the amenability to increase precision? So where is it that we can keep pushing to determine more and more properties of dark matter with increased precision? Uh, and the second question is um, how much do we tolerate our ignorance of what dark matter in fact is? How much Something like what Perrin was able to say, which is, we don't know what atoms are, and he knew that they have weird vibra vibrational degrees of freedom. He knew that there are all kinds of things that we didn't fully understand, but he could still say, whatever 
these things are, they have to be sort of dynamically independent, localized bits of stuff. And I can count them. And that's what he could say with confidence. So he could say there's a sort of permanent contribution to our understanding of the atomic constituents of matter that will constrain whatever comes next. And so I think one question then is, to what extent do we have a permanent or you know, plausibly permanent understanding of how dark matter contributes to astrophysics and cosmology that we can take as constraining whatever comes next? So that's just a setup for, I think, a few questions that are interesting uh, related to what you were saying. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. And um, mm -hmm. I've, I've just been uh, reading about Pren um, uh, mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm working on a, a book about sort of quantum physics or subatomic physics and going through his like Nobel speech, which is a beautiful, mm -hmm. lay, uh, beautifully lays out his argument in wonderfully accessible terms. But um, but yeah, I definitely see this this parallel between like there's something we, we just absolutely cannot see. Right, and in the in Perrin's case, it was it was because there was it was impossible at that time to have the resolution to see an atom, um, you know, with any kind of experiments that they had. In this case, you know, it may be that dark matter is just just fundamentally invisible, and we will never actually see it. And, there, and there's there's also the the annoying fact that um, there's nothing about the evidence for dark matter that says that it should interact with our detectors ever. Mm -hmm. Right, there, there's. All of the evidence for dark matter is that it's something that is collisionless and has gravity, um, but it, none of it, nothing says that it should have any other um, particle interaction. And we, we need some other particle interaction to get a, a solid detection in the way that people talk about, like a direct detection, uh, or even indirect detection um, or production. Um, and uh, and that's uncomfortable, right? And there's uh, usually the argument we make is that. Um, if it doesn't have any interactions, any particle interactions, it's quite hard to get it into the universe. Um, so you need it to have come out of the primordial soup with everything else. And that, you know, so if it was in equilibrium with the in a, the, the plasma that was that was produced at the end of inflation, then um, you know, then there that it should have some interactions with regular matter. But there are ways around that, annoyingly. <laughs> so there are ways to there are even ways to produce it purely gravitationally, which sucks. Um, but there are also ways to, to use a mediator particle that, that would then decay and not exist in the present universe, and so there would be no way to get back to that, um, even if it did have interactions in the beginning. So, I mean, I think that, um, I think that in terms of the things that are really stable, um, you know, I think that the, the kind of most stable stuff is, is like on the largest scales. Um, there's, you know, there's very little disagreement. Uh, on the largest scales, that the dark matter is, you know, is a, a very compelling piece of that evidence. Um, that's that's the place where you know people talk about galaxy rotation curves and things like that. But the the most compelling evidence for dark matter is really what it does on large scale structure, both in terms of the matter distribution, in terms and in terms of the cosmic wave background. Um, the the cosmological evidence for dark matter is extremely strong. Um, on the small scales, things get trickier. So when you're talking about what it's doing in individual galaxies, like it's it's quite easy to make galaxy rotation curves by tweaking gravity. And every time uh, every time a new paper comes out that that does these really well by tweaking gravity without dark matter, there's a press release, and and um, you know, and every time I want to say that you didn't do cosmology, you know, um, there are there are models now that can reproduce something like this without technically having a new matter component, but the way they do it generally is to create a new field in the, in the theory that acts exactly like collisionless matter. And then it's like, well, okay, <laughs> maybe, maybe you don't call that matter, but the effect is exactly like collisionless matter. So um, I think that, you know, the places I think we can, we can do better, you know, especially like we can learn more about the small scale structure. So, you know, this, this is a kind of annoying plot, maybe if you look more like this, um, if you look at the, the really small scales on the matter distribution um, in the universe, we can learn something more about how dark matter is distributed on small scales, and that can tell the difference between a lot of different models. So there's a slide I didn't have time to put up, but I'll just uh, put this up now. Um, so there's, uh, with different, um, different models of dark matter from that sort of big branching tree, uh, they have different um, they have different uh, effects on like where the where what what mass of halos would be possible versus like the mass of the particle. So so like if you're talking about um, 
uh, dark matter as um, as like axions, uh, these like super light axions, then then you can only have really heavy halos. If you're talking about um, uh, like atomic dark matter, you can get really small halos. Like so, there's there's a range of places where you know you see a difference from kind of zero interactions uh, based on um, based on uh, different models. And and so if we can if we can really tell if we can really like push down and see uh, evidence for smaller and smaller halos, we can rule out big swaths of this parameter space. And so that would, and that's that's purely gravitational. If we can find a way to see those halos gravitationally, which is hard, it's complicated. You have to use really clever tricks around gravitational lensing, generally speaking. But if but if there's a way to to um, to do those measurements, then then that can really reduce the parameter space. Um, and then I think another thing that's really promising is looking at like things like gra galaxy collisions or uh, galaxy cluster collisions, because that can um, it's a nice way to sort of separate out the regular matter from the dark matter and and potentially learn something about um, about what self interactions the dark matter might have. Um, and then you know of course continue to look for all the particle stuff like indirect detection and and direct detection and so on. But assuming that that we just never interact with the thing, then these are the kinds of measurements that I think are are going to get more precise and, and kind of dial in um, those numbers. Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, I, ha I sort of didn't catch that, but maybe you said it, but could you please tell me what the scientific as opposed to the sociological reasons are, why the sort of seasonal variations in the DAMA results right. are not considered outside of the DAMA collaboration, an yeah. interesting hint at least? Yeah, I mean, for that, mostly, um, let me see where did I put that slide. Uh, mostly, it's just that it's it's ruled out by everything else, and it, it's quite hard to come up with a model that where the dark matter is only interacting with the silicon iodide crystals in that experiment and not with all the other targets. Um, there are not very many experiments with the same target. The one that we're working on within two places will have the same kind of crystals, so that's that's positive that that could help. Um, but but just the fact that that nothing else has has seen any hint. Um, is is really the thing that, that I would say is the scientific argument against. Sociologically, the, it's complicated, but um, but uh, scientifically, it's 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 just it's just how, how well it's ruled out by their experiments. Uh, Sean. Um, yeah. So thanks a lot for the talk. It's really you. interesting. Really nice to see everything put together. But uh, do you have a paper where you go through all thirteen? I, I don't. I've been thinking about yeah. doing that, um, but I, I haven't done that. Yeah, that's not my question. Okay. But um, <laughs> uh, that would be a nice paper for yeah. me to read. Um, but um, so okay, I, I think you paint like a pretty kind of frustrating situation, right? Where you have like all these like really good reasons to think about um, mm -hmm. dark matter, and then all than like the fact that we just can't see it. You know? uh, but then you said something I thought was interesting. You said, what if it's like fundamentally invisible? Um, and that made me think, OK, but if that's where we're going, and maybe we are going that way, but then you have to, I mean, one starts to think about what kind of, have to rethink what kind of a thin dark matter is, right? Because uh, at that point, um, if you just say, oh, no, it's just a thing, it's a, it is a particle, but we can't really see it. Uh, we'll never know for sure that it's a particle. And now you're talking about a very different kind of thing that physics has never really um, been discussing before. I mean, it just seems like it's hard to find paradigms in physics that like um, went for so long mm -hmm. having such a big glaring gap in the fundamental thing. I mean, maybe a time. Uh, so will this emerge? without a fundamental change in the paradigm? Um, I mean, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, it depends partially on what you mean by being sure that it's a particle. I mean, if, yeah. if it acts very much like a particle. Uh, I mean, it basically, there's nothing about dark matter that doesn't look like <clears throat> like heavier versions of neutrinos at the moment. Um, so, so neutrinos, I mean, ne the neutrinos that we know of <clears throat> can't be the dark matter because they're too light, they would wash out small-scale structure, and there's just not enough of them. But if we had 
another kind of neutrino, where a neutrino is a weakly interacting massive particle. It doesn't have very much mass, but it has some mass. It interacts only via the weak nuclear force. Um, uh, dark matter is not different from that in, in, a, in a fundamental way. Uh, we can detect neutrinos, um, but depending on you know how that sort of weak interaction cross-section goes, you could just dial it down to, to the point where we couldn't detect it, right? Um, so, so it's not it's not so exotic, um, and we don't know if it's if it's fundamentally unobservable in in sort of particle interactions or if it's just currently unobservable in particle interactions. If it is fundamentally un unobservable in particle interactions, then we have to kind of decide if if the abundance of evidence of something that acts like a particle um, but but doesn't have an electromagnetic or or potentially weak interactions is something that we're, you know, we just kind of roll with because that's the theory that works best, or if, um, you know, if we have a, a big problem with that. And I, I personally, I don't find it, I mean, I find it frustrating <laughs> that we haven't seen it, and, and I would like to, I mean, I'm working on um, on uh, modeling, you know, inter indirect detection and, and like the effects it would have on early stars if it has some kind of weak interactions and stuff like that. Um, but uh, I mean, I don't, I don't feel like I don't feel like it's necessarily a different kind of science to just say, you know, these are all the all the pieces of evidence that this thing is, is real, and and we roll with it. But you know, maybe, maybe there's a maybe there's a parallel to, to things like you know the wave function is, is or the yeah the wave function is, is fundamentally unobservable, right? Because as soon as we observe it, something happens and we don't see it, right? Um, and so it could be something uh, where you know it's just we just can't see it, but we have we have a mathematical model and, and, and phenomenological evidence, and, and we, we just roll with it because we don't have a better model. Um, but I, I mean, I, I hope that it's more observable than a wave function, but, um, but I, I don't, um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure where it's going to go. Uh, actually, Dominic, yeah. Thanks. Uh, I think it's very related, but sufficiently different to constitute another finger. Okay. Um, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't really get out of you talk why we think it's a, a particle. Like in the thirty things we learned, yeah, it was yeah. never like particular structure okay. on, on the on the right hand side. Oh uh, yeah. So what? I guess what? Why do you think it's a particle? And why else could it be? Could it not just be a field which doesn't have well-defined particle states? Um. So the the when I say it acts like a particle, it acts in the same way that collisionless dust would act. So, so in the sense of like, it redshifts the way that, that like it just, it, the, the equation of state that it seems to obey is the same as, as collisionless dust. Uh, so, uh, you know, a, a W of zero, right? So like um, uh, something that, that, um, that dis distributes itself through the universe in that way. The, the kinds of the shapes of, of dark matter halos are consistent with particles that are in sort of random orbits and don't don't collide, but create um, create spherical ish distributions through sort of interaction gravitational interactions, um, and uh, and so so it's 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 that really and the fact that we haven't seen like a, a smallest structure in it um, where which you you would have for a certain kind of wave nature. Uh, particles or weight nature sort of fluids or whatever. Um, so it's 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 that sense in which it acts like a particle. It acts like a like collisionless dust in, in the way that we expect collisionless dust to move through the universe. Um, well, Chris, this was in line, and then yeah, well, that's from Francesca. Sorry, I was just gonna. I had a brief comment that I think one um, aspect of Sean's question is. Uh, the degree of independence of the different lines of evidence. And so obviously it'd be wonderful if there was a line of evidence that didn't depend on the gravitational interaction, right? But I, I take it, I was going to ask you and I forgot, but uh, do you think it's just sufficient to have all of these lines of evidence that do depend in some sense on a characterization of gravitational interaction? And also, in some sense, they do depend on different aspects of gravity. They depend on gravity at different scales and so on. So. Um, I mean, the other argument seems to sort of a priori assume that if there's a different kind of interaction, it's one that we can detect. And I don't see any reason to make that assumption. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's possible that there could be a, um, an interaction that, that doesn't involve regular matter. So that's why colliding 
galaxies and colliding clusters could be interesting because there could be a there could be an interaction, a non-gravitational interaction within the dark sector mm -hmm. um, that we could in principle see evidence of, which would be awesome. Yeah. We haven't yet done that. Um, but uh, if it, if it's just gravity, I mean, if it is something like a neutrino but heavier and interacts less, then then we're never going to see anything. You know, if it, or if it doesn't have a weak weak interaction, we're never going to see it. the only way it interacts with the universe is gravity, and that's. You know, then, then I mean, I think at that point you have to sort of go into like early universe um, theories and try and see how it's created, like how you get it into the universe, and then check those against other evidence, and that could be an interesting place to go with that. But, um, but I think that the, I mean, basically, if you think about it in terms of comparing models, we have so many pieces of evidence that fit this model of you know collisionless matter um, better than alternative models. Then at the, at the moment, the best you can do is go with that model. And if you've come up with something else, that's great. But at the moment, we just don't have anything else. So we need something to, to call it. That's what we call it. Yes. Yeah, I have an observation that I want to share regarding that is a very general consideration regarding how we uh, support or we discard uh, models. Uh, so you were mentioning a certain point, Mond, uh, and uh, the fact that is, uh, there is a tension. And uh, my reaction was, uh, but uh, what if uh, we have a different phenomena acting at different scales? Uh, and this is a more general question because uh, my impression is that uh, when we look at all these different models, uh, we are often assuming that uh, all dark matter uh, is concentrated in one particular uh, particle or one particular uh, modification of gravity, and uh, and we try to check whether this encompass all the phenomenology that we see. And uh, of course, there is, uh, in in philosophy of science in general, uh, parsimony is one of the uh, properties that we want to see. So we want just one thing that explain everything. And if it does, then we have more confidence. But what if there could be more sources uh, that contributes to uh, dark matter? And what I have in mind is, for instance, uh, the case of uh, primordial black holes. Uh, because in that case, all the constraints uh, have changed uh, in the years. So there were old works for which uh, uh, basically the title was uh, Primordial Black Holes as the matter are excluded. But then you look into the details and you discover that um, what they have excluded is that all the dark matter is saturated by black holes so with a particular <coughs> mass. And these days, for instance, if in, we include more information, so like the possibility to have a very wide mass spectrum for black holes, or if we include the fact that that matter cluster, and it's not just equally distributed everywhere, we have a completely different constraints for, in fact, we have very little constraints for primordial black holes. So my question is somehow, uh, besides the, observ the general observation is, uh, uh, to you, uh, um, what's the feeling in the community with respect to this, and how you see the limitations of the methodologies that are applied? Um, I mean, I've written a few papers about primordial black holes uh, as dark matter candidates. I think that um, you know there are certain models that, that work better than uh, than others. Um, and and uh, no, I shouldn't put the, you know. Um, so you know, it's 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 in here as one of the things that's being explored. And, and as I mentioned before, there there could be different. Um, there could be a, a range of like different pieces of this picture that could all exist at different levels. Um, I, I think that uh, I think it, it, what's harder is to say that gravity modification is only is only uh, accounting for certain phenomena because because we do see a very consistent picture of gravity's uh, interactions over over all these different scales. Um, so I think it, it would be quite hard to combine modified gravity with any of these pictures. There there are certain caveats to that. You can take you can throw a little bit of dark matter toward modified gravity models, but then it's uh, depending on who you ask, it makes them less compelling. Um, if you if you can also just solve everything with one kind of stuff, but the the point is, I think it's interesting that one kind of stuff does fit all of the observations right now, um, and and that's uh, I don't know if that's if, if like we're not necessarily presupposing that it's the same kind of stuff, but one kind of stuff will do it. Um, so it could be that there's some mix, and that's why we haven't observed certain phenomena. Um, and that's people are actively looking for that. There are lots of uh, proposals of, of mixed kinds of dark matter. So I think that 
you know, yeah, it could go that way, and we're, we are looking for that. But um, but ultimately, you know, whatever's making up the the total mass on the larger scales probably also has to be making up the galaxies themselves, because the total mass is made of the galaxies, and it's quite hard to 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 not have that happening. So, Luca, I'm going to take. It to the end. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, so. Uh, I was wondering if you think that gravitational waves could help us to get some insight into the nature of dark matter. Could you because... speak into the mic? Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> now I was wondering if you, you think that dark matter could help us to get some insight into the nature of dark matter because I would expect that in events like in situations like the cluster, mm -hmm. uh, the bird cluster, uh, where you actually have collisions, you could get different gravitational wave signatures if that model was like point-like or if like more smoothed out or something like that. Yeah, so we have this paper that's all about lots of different ways to, to try to characterize dark matter by looking at gravitational wave um, things. So, so the kinds of things that you can do with gravitational waves, um, there are primordial black hole things that make gravitational waves, so you can potentially look for, for those. Um, there are different kinds of gravitational wave phenomena that happen due to cer certain phenomena in the early universe that could be connected with the existence of dark matter or just new fields. Um, and there are certain kinds of dark matter uh, that, um, that could affect uh, like black holes such that when black hole collisions occur, you can see different, um, uh, different uh, phenomena based on the interaction with the dark matter around the black holes. So there's a whole range of things. So I would, I would definitely say check out this paper. And, and we just kind of sketch through. It's a very short paper, just sketching through a bunch of different possibilities. Um, but yeah, there's there's a ton of interest in gravitational waves right now as a, as a general tool. And so I'm sure there are even, you know, this is from a few years back. There are probably lots of new ideas for using gravitational waves to learn about dark matter. Um. I see lots of pizza sitting over there. <laughs> okay. I know people have been kind of waiting, and well, maybe is the, if there's a quick question, we can do that. Otherwise, I will remind you there's a discussion at the end, and then we can have lots of time to talk about your question. Uh, all right, Nils, you, I'm going to ask Francesca to be yes. at the top of the list for this uh, yes, for the discussion, yeah. and then we'll take a quick one from Ray. Sorry, I'm not sure if this is a quick question or not, but... <laughs> um, so, Can I remind you about the pizza? <laughs> um, I had a question about... So, in this talk, you talked about um, a variety of anomalies, mm -hmm. and there seems to be a sort of a guiding um, I don't know, principle or something that compels us to unite various anomalies under one banner, one, you know, dark matter or something. Um, I had a question about, in particular, the galactic center gamma rays. So your explanation for there, for that situation was, you know, taking away all the known phenomenon, um, there's still some gamma rays. Um, what makes us think whatever the explanation is at all dark matter related? Uh, we, I mean, we, we don't. I mean, it's, it, it's so the problem with, the problem with looking for, for, the problem with indirect detection is um, basically if something happens that you don't expect in the sky, you can be like, maybe this dark matter. Right, and, and because because we don't know what dark matter does, we 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 have so many different theories, so many different models that have different phenomena. You can either start with a model and say it would produce this phenomenon, and then go look for that, or you can s see something happening and say what's a model that could explain that. And uh, and people go both directions um, on, on that uh, process, but um, basically, like if if we see some process that that seems like it could be connected to some new particle physics phenomenon that, that is not currently included in our expectations, then we have kind of a limited uh, set of things that could be doing a new new particle physics thing. And dark matter is one of those things that we know it's, we know dark matter is real, or we're pretty sure. And uh, if it has some particle interaction, it would do something that we didn't expect to happen. It wouldn't be included in our current models. So, so, but that's the big problem with these kinds of things is that you, you you fundamentally you know don't know that it is definitely dark matter doing it. You have to what you have to do is try and link phenomena at different scales or you know different with different uh, like maybe if you saw like there's there's a suggestion that um, that uh, there's one paper I saw a few years ago that said that um, 
Uh, the galactic center excess and the antiproton excess could both be produced by a certain kind of model, right? And that would be nice, right? So, so we look for things like that where you can see the same phenomenon with different uh, probes. That would be ideal. Um, but uh, you know, if you just see one extra thing going on in the universe that we didn't anticipate, right? So it's very hard to say that we and we've definitely ruled out everything else. Should we stop there? Yes. Okay. Thank you.